Welcome back to The Caption Life. Yesterday, June 12th, was Superman Day. So to celebrate that, in this episode, we're going to review of the comic series Superman Birthright. And I am doing the review with former co-host Kevin Stolicker. And today's highlight is going to be Phoenix Comics and Games. They are located in Seattle, Washington, and they are Capitol Hill's premier comic shop. They have manga, graphic novels, board games, collectible card games, and role-playing games. Let's get started. Hey, and welcome to The Caption Life, a show for the most casual and dedicated fans of comics and a member of the Comic Watch family. I'm your host, Sean. Join me and discover what the world of comics and graphic novels have to offer. From one-on-one interviews with industry professionals, roundtable discussions with passionate fans, and reviews on the latest comics, TV shows, and movies. Now let's dive right on in. Hello, everyone, and thank you for tuning in to the show. Yesterday was June 12th, which was Superman Day. So to celebrate this comic book hero, we're doing a comics review and commentary of the series Superman Birthright from DC Comics. It's a 12-issue series that ran from September of 2003 and ended September of 2004. It was written by Mark Wade, penciled by uh, Laniel Francis Yu, which I hope I pronounced that correctly. I apologize if I didn't. Inked by Gary Alag- uh, Alangulan. Again, apologize if I mispronounced that. Colors by Dave McCaig and lettered by Comic Craft. As you may know, I select the comics we're about to read by uh, taking the recommendation from our guest host. So please welcome back to the show our co-founder and former co-host, Kevin Stolicker. Kevin, as many of you know, is a longtime comic book and superhero fan and is a public educator. He is constantly finding new ways to weave his love of pop culture into the classroom. Kevin, thank you for coming back on the show tonight, man. Hey, glad to be back, man. This is this is my home away from home, so I'm glad to I'm glad to get to guest on another episode. I know, I, and I'm telling you, I'm I'm hoping you know that our fates will realign that you can come back on the show uh, regularly and, and be a co-host again instead of a guest co-host at some point in the future. So, mm-hmm. how how's uh how's everything going outside of you know the world of comics and everything like that? How's everything else going for you? Oh, I'm just just finished year sixteen as a as a public educator here in Texas. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I'm I'm about at the halfway point, I guess, of my <laughs> of my career. Um, uh, you know, May is a is a hard month to get through when you're a teacher. But yeah. you know, I'm, I'm made it to the summertime. I've already got to go on a little bit of a family vacation. Got another one to look forward to uh, next month. And other than getting my wisdom teeth removed this week, um, it should be a pretty slow summer. So, yeah, uh, and hopefully if, while I'm recuperating, I'll get a chance to read some comics and stuff. So there you go. Now, um, I was just remembering in last year, I think it was last year, mm-hmm. uh, we went to Dallas Fan Expo together. Uh-huh. And that's actually just this past weekend. Did you? Yeah, it was know going on. We, we really thought about leaving our um, when we left our family vacation uh, on Friday about going up there. Um, uh-huh. but we just, we've got too many other commitments in, uh, this summer. So we decided, we decided against it. We did have, we have seen on Facebook and social media, a lot of our friends that had gone mm-hmm. and m- my wife has several times looked at stuff and said, yeah, we, we might, we, we probably could have gone, but, um, we would have ended up spending way too much money on stuff we didn't need. And, and I was in agreement <laughs> with her. So, right. um, I, I really would have loved to have gone and meet some of the comic creators. Um, I was trying to like win her over by by su- suggesting we could go and meet Ralph Macchio and uh, Billy Zabka because she's a big um, we're all big Cobra Kai fans here in this house. But um, right. yeah, we didn't get a chance to go. Uh, t- 2023 may be the year that I don't get to go to a Comic Con. Really? Um, yeah, it's it's just uh, the stars haven't aligned yet for it um, uh-huh. for just yet. Um, and I'll be honest with you, like I, I, I was busy during, um, Houston's comic Palooza, which is Memorial day weekend. Mm-hmm. And we had plans that, that interfered with us going to Dallas fan expo. There's a couple of other ones that like I might be able to go to, but I am not a big fan of comic cons in the summer here in Texas. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's, so, it's so hot. It's very hard to like cosplay. Um, and so, Looking for one in October <laughs> might might be my last hope, but right. but we shall see. Yeah, yeah. I I will be honest to say that some of the things I've seen on social media, um, I don't know if it's just you know 
I happen to notice these things or what, but some of the people are reporting, you know, some of the experiences that they had that were like subpar for Dallas Fan Expo. And I felt like, and, and you and I have been kind of honest with each other about this. When I went last year, um, Saturday last year for Dallas Fan Expo was a terrible experience for me because I felt like you couldn't move around mm -hmm. in the exhibition hall. And so I remember being done at like 2 p.m., because I felt like I was bumping into people. I couldn't get through anything. And I remember being done. And it sounded like uh, from some of the other people that I've been reading on social media that I follow that they've had kind of a similar experience, whether it was very congested or I guess, you know, some of the uh, photographs and autographs have been kind of a, a nightmare in terms of waiting in line to try to get that, especially uh, what was really odd. It was, I think some people had like VIP and then they were told to wait at the back of the line, things like that. So Oof. Uh, I know it's just, you know, and, and not every, not every, uh, convention is going to be stellar or anything like that. Um, so I'm just hoping that it's something that is more of a fluke and it's like something weird just happened this year. Kind of like, you know, when we went to PopCon, um, together mm -hmm. for the first time, that was the first time they did PopCon, um, you know, after the, uh, COVID, you know, pandemic happened and everything. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of it was them trying to balance all the things with putting on a convention after so long with this new pandemic. And we remember we had like, it wasn't a terrible time, but, but it wasn't a great time either. And I feel like every pop con since then has actually improved and gotten better. Um, so who knows, like every, every convention has a year where, you know, maybe there's just, it wasn't a great year for whatever reason, and hopefully it'll yeah. be better next year for people. So. Yeah. I can say having gone pre pandemic and post pandemic that I think part of the problem with fan expo in Dallas is that they're using the same plan, mm -hmm. um, over and over again. And it's grown so much like that. I mean, it's a huge comic con and they have tons right. of celebrities, tons of artists. It's it's by far one of my favorite to go to because you, of the access you have to the to the guests that are there. Mm -hmm. um, however, on Saturday when you have fifty thousand people there, yeah, um, it's just so crowded, and they need to they need to book up more of the convention center and and utilize the space to spread everything out a little bit. Agreed. Yeah, because that was the thing is they packed in so much with that. That's why it was just really congested. Is that it wasn't it was a small space by any means like i remember thinking how big it was but they mm -hmm. just needed more space to accommodate the all the vendors they had all the guests they had all the art you know the artist gallery that they had and all the people that are going there and i remember that was just you know part of the problem was yeah. they just didn't have enough space for all that i think when it comes to all comic cons you have to like balance the amount of space you have with the like affordability for like the vendors and whatnot. Mm -hmm. But I would, I would argue that if you cut, like if you, if you cut 10 to 20% of um, like the list of vendors down, or maybe you charged more for the vendors table so that you had fewer, some, mm -hmm. something in order to be able to spread them out better. You yeah. Probably you'd probably as a vendor would come out um, even still ahead because how much are you not selling because people can't see what you're selling because the, the aisles are so crowded? Yeah. You know well, what I mean, so yeah. And, and, and fan expo last year, um, the most congested part of the whole convention was the artist gallery because they did mm -hmm. not have enough room in between those rows for people to go by. I remember, you know, if you had somebody on either side talking to the artist, like you couldn't even get by because there mm -hmm. was that, Whoa. So mm -hmm. I, I agree with you. If they come up with some sort of way to either reduce the number um, in some sort of capacity just to be able to spread things out a little bit, I, you know, I think they, they could definitely do that because it was really weird not to, you know, get off too much on this, but um, it was really weird that one part of the convention hall was very, very compact. And then the other part was actually more spread open, which you needed to because that was where all the like food vendors were and, mm -hmm. and some of the cosplay stuff and, and things like that they're having. But it was just I remember like the right half was just packed with people and then the left half was a little bit more spread out. But that's because you needed that in order to accommodate all the things that are going on in that section. And so it feels like Absolutely. they have to do something to address that. So. Yeah. Uh, but we, we could do a whole episode on Dallas Fan Expo some other time. Well, I mean, and, and, and not, conventions not in knock, general. <laughs> not a knock on Fan Expo because I'm guessing, right? I'm guessing that most places are trying, most conventions are trying to squeeze the most out of the space they have. And that's yeah. part of the problem. Yeah, I know. And, and I, I know, you know, planning and, and reserving convention halls, stuff like that is a logistical challenge for a lot of people. Like, I know Indiana Comic Con. Um, 
they re- they reserved it this weekend on this year on a weekend where it was free comic book day. So that kind of put comic book stores in a pickle. And it was also the same weekend as the biggest uh, marathon for the state. I don't think just the city, but the state of Indiana. Um, and it ran like right outside the convention hall as well, too. And so I remember thinking like that was a bad weekend. But apparently from what I hear from people, when they're booking convention halls, uh, they're already limited to what weekends they can actually pick. Mm-hmm. So my guess is there was probably a reason why they picked that one versus the other ones, which I can't remember. I can't fathom why that would be, but you know, it, it is what it is. So, yeah. um, but yeah, like I said, we could do a whole thing about conventions and things like that, but we're going to be talking about Superman birthright. So before we get into that series, uh, Kevin, why don't you tell us a little bit about your origin story with the character Superman? What got you into um, that character? Was it comics? Was it movie, TV show? Kind of tell us, you know, how you got started with Superman and how your relationship with that character grew from there. Yeah. So um, my first real uh, exposure to Superman as a kid was probably when I was like seven, almost seven years old. Um, my family went on a uh, builder's builder's mission trip to Paducah, Kentucky, which mm. um, is right across the the river from uh, Metropolis, Illinois, which is the the adopted home of Superman. And like while we were while we were there, we went and visited Metropolis, and they have they have a huge statue of Superman in downtown now, uh, but back back and when i went it was you know it was probably only about eight feet tall um but uh, that was also right after superman 4 the quest for peace had come out and i'd seen that movie like so many times uh uh we've talked we've talked about the how like that was that and batman was kind of a one-two punch for Mm -hmm. um for uh for like the the growth of the fandom and 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 my personal history but uh my last name stoliker means um steel corner in german and uh so the man of steel has always been um like had this like this draw to me um and when i was in later elementary school i got this from the from the local library i got this huge collection of like classic superman stories from um, like the comic strip days and the early the early days back when he was like fighting Nazis in in World War II. Um, right. And and uh, probably the time that I got into comics in the early nineties was the was right about the time they decided to kill Superman. And so yeah, um, oh, like I remember these, that issue. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. All these all these things uh, over time have like built up, but um, like at any one particular time. Uh, uh, at any one particular time of the day, I'm I'm often wearing um, at least three pieces of like Superman like <laughs> memorabilia on me. I have a Superman wallet. Um, I have a Superman logo on my watch. I I just recently got this uh, Superman. Uh, oh, nice! This ring uh, that my yeah. wife got me, and I, I wear it as my wedding ring from from time to time. Are you um, serious? Oh yeah, yeah. I wear I wear it on my, my on my my wedding ring. It's just a silicone <laughs> thing, so it's like um no it's but it's funny because my wedding ring my original wedding ring uh uh was actually made out of gold and stainless steel but you can't resize it because it was stainless steel and i've lost Mm -hmm. weight since i got married and the jewelry store that i got it from said that you know if i ever need to get a different ring because the you know sizes change i can come back and get it well it went out of business and so i can't get a new ring so i uh, my wife and I talked about just me getting kind of like a new ring, but kind of cheaper. But that way I have a wedding ring on because I didn't have mm-hmm. one for the longest time. And I want to get one fun. And uh, it's also a Superman ring. Oh, nice. <laughs> <laughs> so it's just it's it's more it's more proof that we may have been brothers separated at birth. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, mine is from Groove Life. Uh, I also have yeah. the, the belt, the like magnetic Superman logo belt. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. I I'm a huge I'm a huge Superman fan. Um, just, you know, the, what the man of steel and the S as you know, my last name. Um, I love the character, um, of, of Clark Kent and Superman probably because like, I really identify with, um, the fact that like, he is so, um, like he's uh, not that I'm powerful, but that Clark is so powerful and he has the ability to do all these amazing things, but he, mm-hmm. he's torn with, um, trying to be everything to everyone all the time and and essentially the messiah complex but um 
but between that and then some of the newer stuff that um, Peter Tomasi has written about, about him being a dad and things like that have really mm-hmm. resonated with me in recent years. Um, and so like the, I feel like the character has kind of evolved with me as I've, as I've grown up and whatnot. So yeah, Superman, Superman has always had a, a really special, a really special place in my heart. Yeah. I, I, um, so we grew up around the same time. Right. Mm-hmm. And, um, similar with me as well as I, I don't think Superman four was my first, um, introduction to Superman, but Christopher Reeve was my introduction to Superman. Right. And right. so I think for a lot of the characters and superheroes that, um, we were introduced to a lot of it was from TV shows and movies because at that time that was where the booming of those characters was happening at was through, um, film and through TV shows. And so I can't remember which movie I saw first. That was Christopher Reeve. I remember Christopher Reeve being the first Superman that I grew up with. Um, and the first Superman comic that I read was the same one as the death of Superman. Mm-hmm. Um, because again, like I, I, at that point I was casually reading to comics. I mostly read comics that my uncle had. Um, and I can't remember if he had Superman comics or not. If he did, I don't remember which ones they were, but I remember the ones I bought was the death of Superman because that was a huge pivotal moment that you just like, as a kid, like I can't, you know, fathom like Superman dying because he was like invincible. So that was the first time that we saw him die, um, in pop culture. Um, and then I remember after that, where they had like the four different Superman, I loved the man of steel, John Henry Mm -hmm. irons. Um, I thought he was so great in that, um, that I, I remember loving that character. He was my favorite one of the four that they had come out there. Um, and then, of course, we grew up with the TV show um, Lois and Clark, the new adventures of Superman. Um, so, yeah, my, yeah. <laughs> uh, my wife met Dean Cain at a, at a Comic-Con a few years ago. So yeah. we have we have the autographed Lois and Clark um, memorabilia in the house, too. Yeah. Yeah, so like all those things were kind of my introduction to Superman. But I remember as a kid, I loved Superman. I don't know if you had this experience, but when you were a kid, did you get the Superman costume where you thought that if you put it on with the cape that you would magically fly like Superman? Um, I always wished that I could fly like <laughs> Superman, but I don't know that I ever had the costume or anything. As a oh, kid. okay. Gotcha. I, I remember getting the costume. And I remember thinking like, having the costume wouldn't enable me to fly like Superman. <laughs> and I thought I was doing something wrong every time I jumped and it wasn't actually flying. This isn't working. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, well, let's. You know, I, I have gone through a number of like Superman t-shirts, um, yeah. which like the last one that I had before the one that I have on, um, I've probably had since the, since the year after um, I got married, which I've been married for 17 and a half years now. But um my i was gonna throw it out a few years ago and my wife loved it so much because it's like i guess it's worn out and it's like super soft and the the superman logo is barely like visible anymore because it's just it, I, I you know i wore it out but mm-hmm. like she wears she wears it as like a night shirt now because like it's it's just it's it was too special to throw away i guess to her so yeah um but yeah no i've, I've had my number of i've had a number of t-shirts i've not i've not ever owned the the cape <laughs> well, I think for your birthday, I'm going to have to rectify that. <laughs> okay. You send, send me a cape. I will send you a cape. I'll, I'll, I'll find a really nice cape. Not the I'll suit, off, just the cape. I'll, I'll jump off the I'll jump off the roof. And we'll see what happens. And have, I'll Madden, tell my... have Madden be there to catch you. <laughs> yeah. Or no, just let Madden do it first. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> hey, uh, Sean says this cape works. So oh yeah. It's it's Give verified. It it's it's 100% crypto uh kryptonite, right? <laughs> Kryptonian, yeah. Kryptonian, yeah. Sorry, Kryptonian, yeah. yeah. 100% kryptonite would be the wrong thing Well, yeah, exactly. Kryptonite. Or or is it? <laughs> <laughs> um well, let's go ahead and dive into uh Superman Birthright. For those of you who have not read the series and you don't want it spoiled for you, now is the time to turn this off and wait until you read it and then come back to this. Um, but let's dive into Kevin, why you decided for Superman Day for this episode, you wanted to read and review Superman Birthright of all the series of Superman that you could have picked. Yeah, um, I can't remember. It's been about 10 years since I read Superman Birthright the first time. Um, and even like thumbing over it again in the last couple of weeks before um before we started re- recording this, um, it's it's just one of my favorite uh standalone superman stories Mm -hmm. and i i don't really buy into the notion of canon 
um, in modern comics because the characters have been like Superman himself has has been killed and come back to life. Like everybody's everybody's story has changed so much that um, it's hard to it's hard to say like this is canon or that is canon. The only yeah. things that are canon are like you know that Batman's parents were killed outside of the <laughs> theater and that Superman came from uh, another another planet or whatnot. Mm-hmm. Um, but what what I love about the story is that it was it was a new origin story. It was an updated origin story right. um, for the for the 21st century. The thing is, it's, it's 2023 now. This was written 20 years ago. Yeah. Um, yep. And you could open it to you could open it right now. And it's just as it's just as like timely and topical in 2023 as it was in in 2003 Mm -hmm. um i i don't know i don't remember it doesn't rely like heavily on um you know the thing that the thing that gives stories away now is like the communication technology like you can tell when a movie or something was from based on the type of the type of phone that they they Mm -hmm. use in, in the story um but I think I think that aside, it really is a 21st. It is the, like the epitome of 21st century um, Superman story, and um, and it's it's the reason the reason why um, Mark Wade wanted to write the story in 2003 was he wanted a, a, an updated origin story, kind of the same way that. Um, Kind of the same way that Superman the movie did in 1978, mm-hmm. um, and and he like su- the Superman movie from 1978 is 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 a fairly timeless um, film, and mm-hmm. I think that the I think Birthright is also a quite timeless example of how like comics can transcend over times. All that being said, here here we are in 2023. You you mentioned that yesterday was Superman Day. Superman is celebrating his 85th birthday. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And and this summer uh Superman the movie celebrates its 45th mm-hmm. birthday and this comic that we're talking about is 20 is 20 years old. And mm-hmm. so there's a there's a lot of I think um there's a lot of gravitas that comes along with, with like these these stories like and and the ones that can really really stand up to the test of time. Right. Yeah, and in this series when I read it um Unless you were, it, you, I could tell it was a 2003 book because first of all, you know that's when we were, you know, in high school and college, and there's the events of 9/11, the war mm-hmm. in Iraq that happened, and there are some pages in one of the issues where it was clearly kind of addressing that. Mm-hmm. Um, that thought was really interesting. We'll talk about that a little bit later, but it was definitely a timely piece in terms of what was going on in the United States around that time. It didn't really focus out on the whole story, but the fact that they were talking about um, specifically, you know, anti-terrorism um, strategies and stuff like that, mm-hmm. that was definitely something that probably honed in a lot more during that time than if it was written, you know, five years ago or um, five years prior to that. Mm-hmm. Right. 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 Um, but what's interesting when you said, you know, talking about canon and things like that, I don't know if you knew this, but I was doing a little bit of research about this series um, after I read it. And apparently this series wasn't supposed to be canon, Mm -hmm. but I guess DC Comics decided that they wanted to make it canon. So they replaced John Byrne's Man of Steel series with this one, which I thought was really interesting that I've never heard of a story being canon. It then kind of got knocked out and replaced by a different series as canon in in this way. Which to me, to me is silly uh, because... (laughs) Because it has since been removed as canon. Um, by, oh, has it really? Yes. Like uh, <laughs> the in- Infinite Crisis, the Infinite Crisis crossover um, from like just a few years after. Oh, yeah, yeah, 2008 yeah. Gotcha. or 2009. Mm-hmm. Infinite Crisis um, changed, I guess, decanonized Birthright. And then um, when like several years later, uh, there was a... Um, it was... Uh, he writes everything for DC. They they came out with a new uh, Superman secret files and origins. Um, Jeff Johns and, Jeff and Johns, Gary okay. Frank. Yeah. Um, yeah, they did, it, and that has officially replaced it as quote unquote canon. Mm-hmm. Um, 
but it's it's all in the it, all the stories are the same. It's like Superman comes from um you know comes from Krypton and right. the, the 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 devil's in the details especially with this one um in terms of some of the some of the background story between Clark and and Lex Luthor. Right. Yeah. Well, um I wanted to share a couple of listeners thoughts about the series because I asked for people, you know, if they've read the series before, yeah. what they thought about it. And I got a couple of people uh, to respond. So Derek Hoskins, uh, Paperweight Entertainment said Superman Birthright was the first Superman story he read. It was also the first time that he started to understand the appeal of the character. It's also some of his favorite Superman artwork of all time. Mm hmm. And Anthony Bergamini from Comic Watch said, it sounds like Mark Wade will be touching on elements from this in his upcoming DC Black Label book, Superman Last Days of Lex Luthor, which is actually coming out later this summer in July. So, okay. Um, yeah. So, I didn't know about that one. I had to pick that up. Yeah. You know, honestly, I think I've, I've heard about that book coming out, but I didn't realize it was, it was a connection to Superman Birthright, uh, which apparently I guess Mark Wade a while back kind of uh, confirmed that it was going to be a continuation of that story, essentially. So I didn't I've heard of it, but I didn't realize the connection with it. So it's going to come out in July. And I think from the looks of it, I, I looked at it really quickly. It might be just be a single book. I don't know. I didn't see multiple issues or anything like that, but it just may have been that they don't have that up on League of Comic Geek yet. So um so let's kind of do a recap of the series for everybody who either hasn't listened to it yet i'm sorry or haven't read it yet um or people who may have read it and just kind of forgot the details so uh generally speaking just like what we talked about this is an origin story of superman uh the first issue kind of focuses in on the last days of krypton and jor-el and laura l sending kal-el to earth um, and so they have like this whole i think like eight pages kind of build up of talking about you know how krypton pretty much you, you know, didn't take uh, Jor-El's uh, warnings, you know, to heart. And now, you know, the planet's going to explode and, and Kal-El is going to be, you know, the the last surviving son of Krypton, like any other origin story that we've had. Exactly. Um, and then later on, I think they said, you know, 25 years later, we see Clark is out in that West Africa uh, trying to be a journalist. And he was documenting, um, you know, some of the things that's going on with the conflict in West Africa with um, the, uh, reigning, you know, government uh, people and the rebellion that's happening. And he's also trying to figure out like how to use his powers for good without scaring people. Mm -hmm. um, so after that whole thing, and actually the leader of the rebellion group gets killed, um, Clark decides to come home and he decides that he needs to become something for the people, which he gets the idea to wear a costume uh, from the blanket that he got from when he landed on Earth, which has the, you know, Superman mm -hmm. um, House of L's insignia there. And so um, his mom helps him figure out, you know, how um, to make that costume work. But, you know, having like dual identities, she said that she pretty much he needs to make Clark not stand out, basically. Right. So yeah. she's the one that came up with the glasses because his eyes apparently is like way too blue that people are going to notice that. Um, teaches him, you know, he has to slouch. He has to act like, you know, uh, you know, very clumsy and dorky and things like that. And so it's really cool to kind of see how that origin kind of started. It wasn't, you know, Clark always like that, but it was out of a need to kind of hide his identity from being Superman as well. Yeah. Um, and then I he goes to Metropolis. So yeah, go yeah. ahead. And I think, I think that aspect of it, really gives um really gives meaning to the way that Christopher Reeve um uh portrays Clark in the mm -hmm. in the original Superman film. Right. Um because he does like really, really ham up the the clumsiness and and there's a the there's, there's a scene and and I think there's a scene in every single Superman movie <laughs> where he's <laughs> contemplating telling Lois yeah. that that he's Superman. And so he, he's, he takes the glasses off yep. and then he stands up, stands more upright. And there's a huge shift in, in mm -hmm. his appearance. And um, to be honest with you, like, I think, I think I've figured out as an, as an adult, like most, most of us only see what we want to see anyway. Yeah. So I don't think it would be too far fetched for him to hide out like that. Yeah. Well, and what's interesting is one, you're absolutely right. I think that was brilliant acting um, from Christopher Reeve to show how Clark Kent and Superman can appear like two different people. Mm -hmm. Like that was brilliant acting. It's a clip that goes on TikTok all around just to show 
how that's possible from an acting point of view. And, and he nails it really well. And just like you mm-hmm. said, every movie has something like that. Um, but what's also interesting is I hear about this tip tidbit all the time is that I guess Christopher Reeve has said before that when he was on set as Superman, all the the women would notice him and like would be watching him and stuff like that. But then when he is walking, I, I don't know if it was like as Clark Kent or just himself, he would get like no attention at all whatsoever from from the women on set. And so like clearly there's something, a you know, a little bit of truth behind how somebody could still be, you know, unrecognizable if they, you know, act different or just have the glasses on, things like that. And there's been like a lot of theories about how Clark has done things or, you mm-hmm. know, Kal-El has done things so people wouldn't recognize him either. Yeah, I don't even think I don't even think we need to acknowledge that he would have some sort of like mind control powers to make you see him differently. I right. think that a lot of it, a lot of his Clark secret identity is built on like um like stereotypes that are like still exist today you know mm-hmm. they evolved through the 50s and 60s we're talking about like the poindexter and the glasses and everything and that mm-hmm. was probably like at its peak between 1978's superman and like 1984's revenge of the nerds right um and so like like you know historically people that looked like that were kind of you know, background characters, they were NPCs. And I think that's what, Mm -hmm. that's what, um, that's what Clark is banking on in terms of, um, in terms of his secret identity. The other thing from the, the other thing from like that part of the book that I thought is interesting is how, um, how heavily Zack Snyder, uh, like pulled from, from birthright in terms of, um, the 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 hope the meaning of hope and the insignia and everything mm-hmm. for man of steel in, in 2013 i think mm-hmm. that every superman story kind of influences the next ones and you can see like oh yeah um, you can see how like the characterization of clark as clumsy in birthright is inspired by the previous um portrayals of him in in the films but mm-hmm. then also this element of his background story is incorporated into future films. And so right. it's like, yeah. I think this is why I don't believe that any, any one story can truly be canon because it's, everything is like a hodgepodge of, oh, yeah. um, of, you know, borrowing from one and the other. Well, especially when you have that long history, like this character has as well too, is it, it can definitely, I mean, there are some things that might be completely conflicting, but all in all, these little details can definitely hold up to being canon. Um, yeah. One Franklin, other thing I remember Franklin that I re- Roosevelt was the president when Superman was in, was invented. Right. Yeah. So. Um, so one of the other things that I remember from this part that I thought was really cool is like a small little tidbit again, that can make a world of difference in terms of people recognizing you is that his mom said he needs to wear baggier clothes. So that way people don't notice his physique mm-hmm. because when he's flying around with Superman, of course, everyone's going to notice his physique, but if he wears tight shirts for as Clark Kent, then people are also going to notice that and going to pay more attention to that. So the idea of wearing baggier clothes so that way it's not skin tight or anything, I thought was a real just again a really you know small detail that makes that work. So yeah. Um, so after that, Clark moves to Metropolis because he said that you know as Superman he needs to kind of have an ear for you know immediate news basically mm-hmm. he needs to know like what's happening now and the daily planet has that reputation so he's going to go and get a job there as clark kent and that's when we get introduced to metropolis being under this anti-terrorism um robots kind of monitoring everyone and kind of looking out for you know potential terrorist attacks um which again in 2003 we just had this experience in new york uh two years prior with the attacks on uh, september 11th and so this kind of really hit home for a lot of people um, in in the U.S. in terms of this is an actual thing that you know could happen if you know we had that sort of technology that they're talking about. Um, then we find out that Lex Luthor is the person that's in charge of these devices, and then one of them goes haywire, and then that's when uh, Metropolis gets introduced to in the world gets introduced to Superman because he stops that machine from um, you know killing innocent people, and then Clark Kent and Lois Lane figures out that Lex was responsible for it. And then later on, we see that there's a flashback that Lex and Clark were actually friends in high school. I guess Lex moved to Metropolis and they were really good friends. Lex was kind of like a social outcast. Smallville. The Lex moves to Metropolis. Yeah. Yeah. 
Sorry. Yeah. So I'm sorry. Yeah. I, I was, my mind was still in Metropolis, but yeah, he, um, you know, they were friends in high school in Smallville. So Lex had moved there and, um, and he was kind of a social outcast, but he was a genius, you know, even when he was a kid, really into astrobiology. And then he was trying to open a wormhole uh, with the kryptonite the piece that he found, which he didn't know was kryptonite or didn't know anything about it to prove that there was alien life. And then because of that experiment, um, there's explosion that demolished his house, killed his father, uh, left him scarred. And then he basically fleed Smallville. And so what's interesting is that when Clark Kent meets Lex Luthor in Metropolis, he tries to say, Hey, there's, you know, it's been quite some time and Lex, you know, just pretends that he never, you know, met him, you know? <laughs> so, mm-hmm. um, so obviously there's some weird like history behind that. Um, so when they come back to present day, Lex realizes Superman doesn't know where he's from. So he tells him about Krypton and how, you know, it no longer exists and he's alone. So Lex uses the wormhole he made with the kryptonite to create these images from Krypton to make it look like Superman was actually a war scout for Krypton and projected these images in Metropolis to make it look like Earth was being invaded and to turn everybody against Superman. So that way Lex Luthor can come in and save the day. Yep. Um, but, you know, long story short, Superman and Lois Lane stops him, exposes what he was actually doing. Superman saves the day. Uh, what was really interesting is um, in the final issue, issue number 12, the wormhole that Lex created actually, you know, Wormholes are kind of these windows, not just between space, but also between time. time. So the window that he made um, allows Superman to tell his biological parents, um, you know, right before they send him off to Earth that he made it. And so his parents got the reassurance before they died that their son made it alive to Earth. And so it was kind of like a nice little wrap up um, to that story. So that's kind yeah. of the long, that's kind of the sort of long of it, basically, of this story. So that that's is... One of- the, that's one the, of my favorite like plot devices mm-hmm. um, uh, that, you know, there's in a lot of, in a lot of visual storytelling, storytelling, there's always uh, there's a, there's a gimmick involved. Right. right? And um, you don't like, it's a Superman origin story. You've seen the origin of Superman a thousand times. Mm-hmm. We really, do we really need to see, um, you know, Krypton explode again at the beginning of the book. But but like it's it makes so much more sense when you we, to put it there and yeah. retell that story when you are when you allow there to be some some closure mm-hmm. at the end and I think that I think you know maybe it's because I because I like closure that it's uh, <laughs> that it's it's so poignant to me yeah. um, in this story but you know I'm a, I'm a big fan of the of the way that 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 worked out yeah well. I'm- and what was really cool about that is that there was really no hint that they were going to come back and circle around to that mm-hmm. until the very last issue because yeah. everything that happened with Krypton and and uh, Kal El being you know shipped off to Earth was all in the first issue and they never yep. really touch on that ever again really until this last issue so it was really cool to kind of have that oh wow you know they kind of you know full circle wasn't expecting that and that was like a really nice touch like really sentimental. It, kind of, um, it does come out of a little bit out of left field, but yeah, but the sentiment. But it makes sense. Yeah, it does. It does. Yeah. It's great. And now I wish that kal knew that his message got across to his parents because he didn't, you know, know that, you know, he right. was like trying, he was saying like, I made, I made it, but he didn't get to see his parents' reaction because the window shut before mm-hmm. um, he could see the reaction, but the panel kind of went off and showed their reaction and, and showed like how happy they were that they did make it because, because jor wasn't even thinking about doing that because he said the chains were so slim that he was like let's not even do that at all but you know his wife said laura l said um you know but whether choice do they have like if they kept them there they would definitely die so yeah. so it was a nice little i, touch I tell that. kids i tell kids that all the time when they're taking a test yeah like, yeah if you don't <laughs> if you don't guess you definitely get it wrong if right you, if you guess you at least have a you know a one in four chance of getting it right. Unless it's SAT, because then if you guess and get it wrong, it does count against you. Whereas if you skip the question, <laughs> they don't count against you. I teach seventh and eighth graders. They're not worried yeah. about the SAT. <laughs> so so let's talk about the writing in the story. What what did you think about the writing? Because uh, um, we're going to talk about the writing. We're going to talk about artwork. We're going to talk about the cover art. Um, so let's focus on the writing here first. So I I like Mark Wade. Um, I'll mm-hmm. say I like Mark Wade. I don't, I don't love Mark Wade. He's not... Um, he's not my favorite writer. There are some things like like Birthright that I absolutely love. Um, I really love his Daredevil run. 
Um, yes, which I know you love too. Oh yeah, um, yeah. Some of the other things, <laughs> some of the other things that he's written that are really held in high regard, um, like like Kingdom Come mm -hmm. uh, and things like that. Um, I'm kind of take it or leave it on, uh, right. but but this one is probably um, amongst my favorite uh, of his stories. I know he's a, a very prolific, um, you know comics writer hall of famer if there is such a thing mm -hmm. um but uh this one this one the, i'll tell you the interesting thing that i that i find about it, and you you kind of touched on some of these things in um your synopsis uh the whole thing is like there's there's not really any originality to any of these stories at this point i feel like that everybody's borrowing something from somewhere and whether mm -hmm. or not it was he that came up with it first or vice versa um uh, like just just in the things that you rattled off, like the the drones that were protecting um, Metropolis, uh, mm -hmm. a lot like what like Tony Stark envisioned Ultron to be, uh, right. you know, a safety net for the world. Um, the fact that he causes the problem so that um, he can then save the day, a la Syndrome from <laughs> the Incredibles, um, and then the the notion that he's a bad guy um, and that he's like an advanced scout for this race of people that are coming to conquer the earth that's like the exact plot of invincible mm -hmm. um because it like omni-man and invincible is is that version of of superman right and um so it's interesting to see how like you could almost throw together a if you put all of these like ideas into like an ai generator you mm -hmm. could almost like churn out a story because so much of this so much of this stuff is like is like hey maybe it's maybe not a ripoff but maybe an homage to like hey do you remember this detail of this story from 20 years ago we're going to flip that on its head now we're going to do it now we're going to do it this way mm -hmm. and um and there's this like you know there's always a link between the versions of superman uh, you know uh or like you know we, I, we had earlier talked about how we both seen um across the spider-verse and there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, not to spoil that movie for anybody there's a lot of talk about canon in, in that film too right. and so um the 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 fact that there can that it can be an original like to me it was a, a very original superman story and probably one of the best superman origin stories that exists but it's not 100 original there's a lot of ideas that it borrows from other places and then a lot of ideas from it have been borrowed to um other stories right yeah yeah i for me i really enjoyed the writing here um th there's a few things i thought was interesting that i'll get to in a second but w one of the things i really like about the writing here is that it really focuses in on how lonely the character of Kal-El Clark Kent is because there is a lot of moments where you see that he is struggling between trying to balance Clark Kent duties and Superman duties, but also mm -hmm. the social aspect because he started to be, um, you know, kind of shunned from the uh, workers at daily planet. And you really saw that in a lot of these panels here. So I thought it was really interesting to kind of see some of those struggles that we don't necessarily see from the character of Superman. We, we definitely see it as, Clark Kent, but you kind of see it as like two separate things that Superman never really struggled with this. But and here we actually see that there's some real struggles in both of those things. Mm -hmm. um, I really enjoy Mark Wade's take on adoption and parenting as well, because, um, you know, Kal El's father, uh, I'm sorry, Clark Kent's father, John Kent, talked about, you know, how he's adopted, but also talks about father and son bonding as being a real thing that kind of transcends bio uh, biology here. And so I really like how he kind of blends those things, but also touches on what it means to be an adoptive parent and kind of the idea of if, you know, the biological parents show up in his life and everything, like what that would mean to them. Mm -hmm. They know it would mean the world to him because every child who's adopted is always curious about the biological family if they don't know the family. But they also, you know, are very honest about would that mean that, you know, their son wouldn't want to be with them anymore or something like that. And so I really like that he touched about those things. Um, I thought it was really interesting about the commentary he made. He didn't uh, he didn't harp on this a whole lot, but just about 
or in terrorism because he had Clark sit in a taxi and the taxi driver talks about, you know, the anti-terrorism devices and the drones and everything. And again, this was at the height where, you know, the U S just got into a war with Iraq and some of the conversations that I were having that I think at the time was probably something that he probably pushed the boundaries on for a lot of people. Cause we're still in a very, as a country, very defensive kind of mode mm-hmm. with everything that was happening on from the social consciousness. Um, so I think this was kind of something that was interesting because even though he really touched on it for one page, I think it was something that was probably, you know, was a little bit controversial at the time. I don't know. I didn't check the history on this, but I assume it was. Um, yeah, it, I mean, it definitely takes, it definitely like it's run from 2003 to 2004 yeah. is really like the, um, the, the jumping off point for the, the, the second war in Iraq. Yeah. And um, it, you know, the war in Iraq wasn't resolved um, for, for another couple of years. Right. Um, like I remember being in my first year of teaching when, um, no, I take that back. No, you you were still in college when was in, when that happened. I'm trying to re- trying to remember when um is it the because technically you know the mission, the mission right? was because because technically the mission was accomplished like six months later, but we're still in Iraq for like another four or five years. Right. Um, yeah. I want to say late two thousand and three. Mm-hmm was when Saddam Hussein was captured. Um yes, in in December of December of uh 2003. So yeah. like nearly right in the middle of the run of this book um like is when is is the is like the peak of um right. the war in Iraq. So uh right. yeah, like but a lot of those a lot of those a lot of our fear um associated with domestic terrorism and stuff like that um has lingered in this country for the past 20 years and um i think i think that like i said it's one of the reasons why it's still such such a timely um read uh, because because it's you because i guess if you're an adult now you kind of remember experiencing that so you have like you have personal experience to draw on right um and this series this is the first time for me i don't know if it's the first time ever in the history of superman but uh in this series we see a couple of teenage kids go to a school and um and uh you know sh- it was a school shooting right mm-hmm. superman stopped that from you know getting any worse i think a couple people may have been injured but he stopped that from getting worse found out that they got the guns from an arms dealer, you know, like a legit gun store owner who sold it to the kids illegally. And so Superman showed up at his store, accused him of doing all this. And then he grabbed the gun, fired it at the guy to scare the living crap out of him and then stopped the bullet before it hit his face. But the guy was like, you know, scared shitless from what happened because Superman said, this is a nine-year-old who just experienced this. They will never be able to get that out from their head. For the rest of their lives, basically. Mm-hmm. But that was the first time I think I've ever seen Superman actually held a gun and fired it at somebody. Yeah. So I thought that was interesting. Yeah. Um, and and uh, it it speaks volumes, like to like that 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 particular issue that we continue to have in our country twenty years later. Right. Um. So Lex Luthor living in Smallville. I'll be honest. I thought this was just something that happened in TV series. Right. Well, that's another thing that feels like they borrowed from Smallville to. So so this is the first time we've seen Lex actually have any connection to Smallville in the comics. You think? I do believe. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. So I was, I was curious about that because when I saw that, I was just like, I, I didn't think there was any association before. So just like what you said, when, when they introduced this, I was like, I wonder if they took this from the TV series. So it sounds like that might mm-hmm. be the case. No, um, like I said, like I said, it's a patchwork of all the stories that have come before it, but it's, it's like, to me, the definitive, um, the definitive uh, mm-hmm. origin. Yeah. Um, one thing I will say that I thought was weird. Um, and I don't know if this gets resolved like in a different series or something like that is mm-hmm. in issue one or two, they made a mention about, you know, L- Lana Lang being missing. I think uh, Clark's parents said something about that, about how, you know, I think he asked about that. I was like any word on where Lana's at. And someone said like, yeah, no one's seen her yet. 
And then that was it. Like it was never brought up again in the entire series. So I have no idea what that was about. Don't know if like she disappeared like prior to the series or what, but I thought it was the weirdest thing to bring her up and then to never resolve it in, in the rest of the series. <laughs> something, something they would have touched on, on the, um, the unproduced sequel. Maybe. Yeah. yeah. And, and maybe they'll do that in this upcoming, you know, last days yeah. of Lex Luthor. <laughs> So, um, so let's talk about the artwork. So this includes the pencils, ink colors, lettering. What did you think about the artwork in this series? So, um, Linnell, Linnell U is, um, one of my, one of my favorite artists. Um, okay. the, the, some of the, like, he's done some huge, huge stories. Like, mm-hmm. um, he did, uh, secret invasion. Um, like he's the main penciler for the secret invasion crossover at Marvel. Uh-huh. Um, before that he did uh the ultimate ultimate um hulk versus wolverine uh-huh. uh which which has an interesting production history and like if you go about and read read it it's like six issues but it took it three years to um <laughs> it took you three years to finish um uh-huh. and then he did a book with mark we- uh no sorry mark millar uh called superior which uh, I really oh, love. And yeah. it's, it's about, it's a story about uh, a boy that's stricken with like, um, uh, is it MS or like cere- cerebral palsy? Like that doesn't have full function of his uh, motor system that he has, like he becomes a superhero. Mm-hmm. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of correlation between like that story and the modern Shazam stories and 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 especially the movie um i kind of felt like shazam ripped off superior a little bit in in terms of the (laughs) in terms of the modern the modern um the movie but um his his artwork is is like when to me when i think about um when i think like that what comic art should look like there's a handful of artists that i i feel like like that they hit the nail right on the head Mm -hmm. uh Neil Adams from a generation previous, you know, Jim Lee, Linnell Yu, um, all those, all those guys to me are, um, are, are exceptional. The thing that blows me away is that, uh, he was 25 when he did this book. Mm-hmm. Like he's, he's only, he's, he's only like five years older than I am. So right. like at 25, he's working on like this masterpiece and I'm <laughs> like still, I'm still trying to figure out, I'm still trying to figure out what I'm doing in my life. I I think I just started teaching at 25. So, yeah. Uh, So I gotta be honest. I am not a fan of the artwork in this series. Well, this is, this is where we, this is where we disagree. (laughs) Yeah. So, so let me, let me start off by saying that I think the ink and colors and lettering were were phenomenal. I think those are, you know, done Mm -hmm. very well. I, I love the colors and the shading that they did in this. The lettering was really good. Um, I was a fan of the artwork. So the first thing I, I need to say is this is more of a pet peeve of mine and not commentary on the art, but I just, I really hate the, um, the corny little S trail that they have in the hairline for Superman. I hate it on Superman. They had it on Laura L in this story. Like the they had curl? it on baby kal mm-hmm. I, I I just don't like it. I, I, I think that's, you know, a little bit, you know, hitting the nail too much on the head. I don't think, you know, I, I get that it's, it's an homage to Christopher Reeve, but, I am done with Superman having the little S like he has the S everywhere. He doesn't have to have it as a little hair thing on his forehead. Uh, um, and I, I, I can't stand it either. I'm going to be honest <laughs> with you. I think the Superman in this story has as Clark has a, a very nice modern haircut. Yeah. And his hair does look very different as Superman, mm-hmm. but also with the S thing, it, it looks kind of stupid. I know. Um, I, I I think I'm just done with it. <laughs> yeah. I think that's one of those things that like they give you a checklist when you're getting ready to write a Superman book yeah. that it's supposed it's supposed to have. Um, and I think it's kind of I think it's kind of ridiculous. Yeah. Um, and, and this I'm, was 20 I'm, years ago. Like if it was today, I would definitely be like, let's move on from this. 20 years ago, this is, you know, barely out of the 90s and that this was still you know, again, given the context of everything, people want something familiar. So I get why they probably did the S hair because this was something that was a prominent trait for Superman. It's just, I'm not a fan of it. I've never been a fan of that. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm looking at the cop, the cover of um, like number one and you have, he's got this, 
uh like the first issue he's got this great um like he's as clark he's got the tie on everything he's got his Mm -hmm. hair parted and whatnot and the superman from that same that same issue looks like it could be a completely different person because of the way they've classically styled um superman's hair yeah um i will say the one the one thing i don't like about the art in it is um a lot of times the like the highlights like if you if you look at um a, like a t-shirt in like the light and there's like you know ripples and shading and whatnot right the the colorist in this particular story used white to highlight the brightest parts of the face or the brightest parts of the skin or whatever and because of that it makes everybody look sweaty yeah, I, I think it's it like depends on the lighting, though, because it wasn't really like that shiny. for all of them. But it, like if it was like a really bright light that was happening, it was white. You're right. Yeah, and it looks and it makes everything look really, really shiny, yeah. which can be can be off putting um, at times. Yeah. But that to me, like, you know, I don't I don't like it any less because of those things. But like there are things like that, you know, when you watch it, you're like, mm, or you look at something, you're like, something doesn't, something doesn't sit well with you. Those, those would definitely be two of the things. Yeah. Um, another thing I wasn't a fan of is there is a couple of panels where you see bullets being shot at as Superman. And the way they really show this is that they show the, the bullet casing, like kind of up close as though that's the bullet being shot at Superman. But if you know anything about how guns and bullets work, the shells are not being projected. They're not the projectile. Right. And so that was the thing that really bothered me again. Like that's a little thing. Uh, but I just remember seeing the casing and thinking like, why is the casing being shot at <laughs> Superman? And, um, I, and that I, may I just be was... a byproduct of that may be a byproduct of Linnell U being 25 and from the Philippines at the time, like, you know, not enough, not enough life experience or at least American experience. Cause everybody here knows about guns. <laughs> um and and the editor but, i guess maybe not catching it well th- that that's what i'm saying is that you know these things go through so many people and maybe mm-hmm. there's just saying maybe they just said let's leave it there so people can get the idea that it's a bullet because like that's how you can see the back of the bullet you know as opposed to like right. a, a round hollow point um from the back of it but yeah so like that part bothered me but the thing that really bothered me the most about the art um by the artist here is that all the people are just drawn really weird. Um, some of the people's eyes were either completely missing or they're pure white. Like they didn't have any, you know, iris or pupils or anything mm-hmm. like that. And that just threw me. It was really weird, especially when you just watch the show um, Sandman and they have, I, um, I forget the guy's name, but um, Corinthian that had like the weird eyes. Like that's what it reminded me of when they didn't have any eyes is it remind me of Corinthian. Or the eyes, you know, were like I said, were pure white. Um, the mouth and teeth looked really odd. Issue one, there's a panel where Clark had a really long neck that's just completely disproportionate. I, I just didn't think how people were drawn was really well done in this series. So for me, I love the story. I love the writing, the art I wasn't a fan of. I will say I love the homage they paid to Action Comics number one. I think it was issue number two when uh when Superman was trying to save uh, everybody that was being attacked in the West African village is he grabbed a car from um, that. Some of the attackers were in and like smashed it against a rock. And it's a clear homage to that cover of action comics. Number one, the first appearance of Superman. Um, So I did really like that, but the artwork I just wasn't a fan of. So I know Derek, my buddy said that he absolutely loves this artwork. I'm sorry. I do not like it. I, 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 I'm glad to be done with looking at it because I just didn't like the art in this. I, you know, and, and it's not the worst art I've seen. Like, it's not like everything was terrible. There's some comic book series I've read where the art was just not great at all whatsoever. That wasn't the case here. I'd probably get it like a four out of 10, maybe five out of 10 for the artwork because there was just some things that was just so distracting that I didn't like about it. Yeah. Inconsistency would probably be the, the, the word for me, but um, one like I said, I think it was a product of I think it was a product of uh, Lineal U being so young at the time. Um, and the other, the other thing is, is I think this happens a lot. Like um, Mark Wade was a was a well known writer at this time, and mm-hmm. I think a lot of times when when you have um, 
when you have a celebrity quote unquote writer, one of the big name guys, they have a little bit more editorial um sway than than maybe like an up and comer was and so like Mm -hmm. there may have been there may have been a push for them not to change anything um so um but you're right about next can we talk about next for just a second because (laughs) um everybody knows how hard hands and feet are to draw but i think next get overlooked with like let me rob liefeld nails it doesn't he what hands and feet <laughs> hands and feet <laughs> i don't know we could go back and look for that's definitely not the case but we could go look at his necks if we wanted to oh yeah um, yeah yeah but here's the thing so my wife was commenting about about this watching um into the spider verse about how the way they draw um kingpin is a, like a hunchback oh so my the, gosh yeah i can't i couldn't stand that. So i love kingpin back, but his yeah. back is up here but his head like sits is it like in the middle of his chest <laughs> yeah he looks and like he's so, constantly like that dancer that does that weird, like, you know, moving the neck around, yeah. but the solar stays still. Like, that's what it looked like constantly for me for Kingpin. He looks I, like, I love that movie, but I did not like Kingpin. He looks like <laughs> one of the one of the Goombas from the original like, yeah. Super Mario movie. <laughs> yeah. Um, but also, I think a lot of times, like, necks get, like, over-exaggerated, uh, yeah. too. And we could do a whole episode on, we could call it the retro nextive. <laughs> the the uh, evolution of next and comics yeah, next or the next the next the next retrospective <laughs> figure out a way to co- combine those two things yeah. yeah it's just it's something that it's something i think that um when you're looking when when you're really into a story and you're looking at the words and the pictures as a whole and you're completely engrossed in it you have a uh-huh. tendency to look past the parts that may be um imperfect but yeah. the other thing is is like a lot of if you watch there's a lot of great YouTube channels where artists will draw things mm-hmm. and they'll talk about how you don't necessarily draw this line or you don't draw that line. You color it this way and it um, your brain interprets it as being a um, as being a fully rendered like picture. Right. So the right. things that they decide to put in and leave out, um, you know, I think every eye interprets that uh, a little bit differently. I can remember watching and I couldn't tell you who the video was, but I could remember watching somebody like draw and color a picture of, of Wolverine. Mm. And it was a beautiful picture of Wolverine. And they start to use Copic markers to like, to like color the, the chin, like underneath the mask and whatnot. Right. And he goes over it with like a layer of like the, the light flesh tone. And then he makes like a little L shape with like the darker one. And it like, it's like, Holy crap. That went from one dimensional to two dimensional with like a few brush strokes. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of that stuff that like, we don't really understand because we're not, we're not artists. Um, but like those details, I think often get overlooked when you're, when you're looking at like, Oh my gosh, this is beautiful. Wait a second. What's going on with his neck? Right. Um, so let's talk about the cover art for the series here. Uh, mm-hmm. Do you remember the cover art for each of the issues? Um, for the most part? Uh, yes. I mean, I rem- I, I have the, um, I have the trade which features bright shiny Superman, which I think is the cover for number twelve. Uh, um, yeah, I can't remember. I think it might be. Um, it's definitely the most like prominent one that's right that's really used. Yeah, and the and and inside here, inside the trade that I have, um, you know, at the beginning of everything, there every new um, issue there is a copy of the cover. Um, I think it's interesting. Some of the covers, some of the covers look, um, they're, they're all kind of like, what's the word I'm looking for? Collages. There's like multiple things going on. Yeah. There's in in them. Yeah. It's, it's like a multi-action. Yeah. Yeah. I do. I do like, um, the cover for number three, where it features like Clark in like just pants and a Superman t-shirt. Mm-hmm um but i don't know what what are your thoughts on the the cover art it it was hit or miss for me i'll say this first and foremost they're very um unmemorable i don't know if that's a word or not but like i couldn't really tell you what were some of the covers just like from reading it and i just read it yesterday and this morning basically okay so so the cover art, I felt like didn't really stand out for me a whole lot. There's a couple that did stand out, but not necessarily in a good way. Okay. So 
issue number four, the cover art is Lois falling out of the building. Mm-hmm. Um, she doesn't seem scared or anything. I think like maybe her eyes are closed, but her facial expression does not seem like she is worried about falling. I think in this issue, she doesn't really create a relationship with Superman where she expects him to save her every single time. So I thought that was kind of odd. I mean, it, it's not a bad thing necessarily. I'm sure they're trying to show her being, you know, kind of calm in the face of danger. Um, but what I really remember from this art is that it was really revealing of her legs. Like if that <laughs> shirt went like any higher, you would probably see what was underneath that, you know, yeah. it's just like really odd. And then issue number seven was kind of a weird thing as well, too, because it was a scene that I don't think showed up in issue number seven, but the cover art was Superman stopping what looks like a mugging. So he's looking at a guy, I think he had a, a gun or a club or something like that. Mm-hmm. And he was stopping that person. And clearly he was robbing or doing something to this woman who's in like in the bottom right corner who looks like she is um in danger she's you know fearful of her life but it looks like her blouse is open and like her yep. bra is exposed so Definitely. I was, yeah so i was expecting like oh this is like maybe some sort of sa uh you know issue that's happened like i don't think that shows up at all right so and this is like cover a of the issue this is not a variant cover or anything like that right so it was just really weird so it's either unmemorable that you can't really remember what the cover was or it was an issue or two for me where that I won't forget because not that it was a good thing but it was just kind of risque a little bit right what they depicted there so yeah so I just I thought the cover art was just kind of strange for this series I I definitely looking back on it because like I said I I read the trade and I probably read the trade five to ten years the first the first time five to ten years after um after the book was released. Mm -hmm. Um, I could definitely tell you that looking at the cover art, I don't think most people would be like thrilled to like to go and pick the book up based on the cover. cover. Yeah. Yeah. Like they really have to go and get the issue because they know the issue and not they were perusing one day and they said, Oh, this cover looks interesting, you know, because there's definitely issues out there that's like that Mm -hmm. where people pick it up based on the cover alone and this series i feel like didn't really have them except for issue number four and seven for the wrong reasons (laughs) right so right um like just by just by comparison like some of the other stories that have been told like one of the things that uh one of the ones that comes to mind um all-star superman Mm -hmm. um the the cover art um in the all-star superman trade the cover art they use from from issue number one Mm -hmm. as the cover for the whole trade as where as opposed to the other one which uses the the cover from 12 for the whole um, i thought that was interesting too but um the covers in all-star superman do a really fantastic job of conveying the story that's going on in the Uh in the in the book Mm -hmm. um as opposed to um birthright yeah yeah Yeah. if you're if you're wanting to compare apples to apples (laughs) like it's 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 pretty it's it is pretty um it's pretty lopsided on that front yeah so that that's superman birthright overall kevin out of 10 stars what would you give the series um this is not objectively, not objective, <laughs> just because because I'm such a fan of and, and listen, I I'm interested to see um, James Gunn's uh, new Superman movie that he's got like in the works or whatever. Yeah, because Superman Legacy. Superman Birthright to me reads like the storyboards for the perfect Superman like um, like you know trilogy kickoff movie. Like this, this is mm. this is what you build your universe around. Um, and so I, I would say it's a solid eight out of eight out of 10 for me. Like I'm, I do have a, like, I do have like perfect Superman, like uh, perfect Superman stories um, in mine, but it's, it's up there um, amongst the best um, right. in turn, in, in, in my opinion. Um, and I've, I've read an awful, an awful lot of them. I, I want to be surprised if James Gunn uses this series and, uh, Superman Earth One as a basis for his film mm-hmm. because that one's another origin story uh, collection that I thought was really well done. 
that mm-hmm. kind of has a similar narrative in terms of like how they're telling the origins of Kal-El and how he becomes Superman in that same sort of idea. So I wouldn't be surprised if he combines those two, but this series for me, I would give it a six out of 10. The story was really well done. I enjoyed the story. I, I just, the art was something that I was just not really was not an, an appeal for me. So um, because of the art, you know, unfortunately for me, it's mm-hmm. going to be a six out of 10. So, so oh, that is, yeah. So that is Superman birthright. Um, as we do with every episode, we're going to end it with talking about the comics we're reading. Just a reminder for people before we jump into that comic watch is um, the caption life is part of the comic watch family. And so the Comic Watch is always looking for people to join our team to be reviewers for comics, TV, film, anime, gaming, anything of that sort. If you're interested in becoming a reviewer, if you've never written a review before, don't let that hold you back because this is a organization that's grassroots, is completely volunteer, and this is where a lot of people get their starting point at. So if you're interested, there will be a link in the show notes below for where you can actually apply to become a reviewer for Comic Watch. And we usually get back with people within, you know, seven days. So if you're interested, check out that link in the show notes. Um, comics that we're reading, we usually start off by sharing what our listeners are uh, reading, and then we'll dive into what we're reading. So from Comic Watch, our editor-in-chief, Matt Meyer, said, currently catching up on the re- on the recent issues of Daredevil, Chip Zdarsky, and Marco uh, Cicchetto, which I don't think I pronounce his name correctly i'm I'm i don't think you pronounce a lot of people's names right i don't i really don't i i I really need to spend more time like trying to find out how to pronounce it i just don't think of it until we start recording i'm like oh yeah i should have done that (laughs) you should see about putting me into google translate to see how like google translate what usually what i do as a you know kind of a side note is if i know how to pronounce a name i type out the phonetic pronunciation i don't type out how their name is actually spelled that's i'll type it out phonetically and that's how a lot of people do that yeah so but i gotta actually look it up and do that and i haven't been doing that for a while so i yeah so i'm probably way off on this but um but matt said that um they're writing one of his favorite daredevil runs in years which a lot of people said that and i'm i uh, confirmed that as well too it's been one of my favorite daredevil runs um in our lumna casters discord channel um kim from the odph podcast says in all caps battle chasers Image Comics, the long-awaited number 10, finally hits comic shops on June 14th. Fantasy, adventure, action, let's go. Um, So yeah, he said that, all caps. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So he's really excited about that. And Joe Loves Comics said, currently reading through and enjoying Walking Dead Compendium, volume number two, among other things. So thank you very much for all those who share what they're reading. Kevin, what are you currently reading in comics if anything, because I know we so, talked about this before. Sometimes you don't have time to read comics and all that, which but, is insane. Yeah, school school just ended. Uh, so I haven't had a chance to pick up anything um here recently. One of the things I will say, and you mentioned you mentioned it before, I, I have Superman Earth One on my bookshelf over here, mm-hmm. and I don't I I've never read it. You I've need read, to read it, man. I I'm, think you'll gonna, enjoy it. I'm gonna read it. Uh I'm gonna read it this this week. I know that I have the first two. I definitely have the first two. I I loved um, Batman Earth One, and I feel like I feel like just the way I feel about Superman Birthright. I feel like Batman Earth One would be a great place to start. Like this is your storyboard. Just make this movie. Yeah. Um, and uh, so I, I'll jump into Superman Earth One. Um, and it's just, I mean I, like I I bought it years ago thinking oh I'll get around to reading this. And and I and I never did, and so <laughs> yeah, yeah. I owe it. I owe it to myself as a fan of Superman. I owe it to all Superman fans, <laughs> at least to get. You owe it to Superman. I do. <laughs> I, I'm telling you, I think once you read it, text me because I think you'll really love it. I think you'll okay. really enjoy it. It's it's a really good one. Uh, for me, so there are a couple of books I'm reviewing for Comic Watch that um, are coming out this week. Batman Incorporated number nine, which if you've been following me on social media or um, been listening to the episodes, you'll know that I'm a huge fan of Batman Incorporated. Um, I had Ed Bresson and John Timms, who are the creators of the current series on the show. Absolutely great. This one is a really good issue because it pretty much raised the stakes a little bit higher that I wasn't expecting them to raise it to. And so it really is a nail biter um, for the series. 
And then the other one I'm reviewing is Battle Chasers number 10, which Kim from ODPH Podcast is talking about how much he loved it. Um, because he shared how much he loved it, that's what made me volunteer Comic Watch to review it. I got to tell you, it's phenomenal, especially if you love D&D and that kind of world. Mm -hmm. It's a really fun one. It has a little bit of everything. It There's humor, there's romance, there's action. It is really well done. Apparently, there's a whole anthology that was written um, issues one through nine like years ago and then they just pretty much yeah. stopped so and now I, they brought I know it a little yeah. bit about that one um i know that yeah. it's joe uh is it madera yeah and and he was he was one of my favorite artists on the x-men in the early to mid 90s it has a very distinct style and around the same time that the guys left that formed image comics joe mm -hmm. also left like the main stuff and started doing um battle chasers and so I know a little bit about it. I've, I've never read it, but um, I know that it has a huge following. So I'm glad to see it. I'm oh, yeah. glad to see it back. Yeah. Um, there, I will say this. There's a character named Red Monica. I know why she's called Red Monica, because she will make your face turn red. Okay, I'm going to look her up <laughs> right now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That captured your attention, right? Yeah. <laughs> um. So those are the two I'm reviewing. Oh, yeah, I know. Her. I know her. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Kevin's saying this with a smile on his face now, too. <laughs> yeah, I remember now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, on my poll list for this week, I have Amazing Spider-Man number 27, not because I'm reading it, but because I'm getting the variant cover that has Mickey Mouse as Iron Man on it. Like, okay. that's the only reason why I'm collecting these issues is for the variant covers for the Disney um you know the variant covers, disney 100 so. is it a it, it, i don't it... think it's tech uh, it might be disney 100 i don't know i have to check and see it but it's definitely a, a like they have these variant issues where they take disney characters and they place them in these iconic um you know marvel avengers poses stuff like that so they had goofy as the hulk from the first issue of hulk where you know bruce banner is kind of like that small human and then the hulk is kind of overshadowing him so they're like recreating some of those with uh, characters from the Disney cartoons. So, okay, I see. Yeah, it is a, a Disney 100. What is if. it? Disney 100. Yeah, I couldn't. Uh, I could. I've Mickey been seeing Disney 100 everywhere. I couldn't remember if this was a Disney 100 <laughs> or if I'm thinking like the Funko Pops and all that. Yeah. Yeah, I see the Minnie Mouse is Captain Marvel. Yes, that's the next one. Man, I want to get 29. some of these. Get some of these posters. Yeah. I'm collecting them. Got, I'm going to put them in like a little case and like hang got them on the wall. Yeah. Daisy Duck is. Um, Daisy Duck as Miss Marvel. I'm going to, have to look up all of them. Mm -hmm. You do that, yeah. It's, I'm going to find really... some find some posters to decorate my classroom with. Yeah. Um, I'm also picking up Marvel's Voices Pride Number One, which I've been collecting that one for the last few years. I absolutely love reading the uh, Pride issues from Marvel. Rogan Gamut Number Four, which Kevin, you need to read. You got to start reading those, man. I'm telling I you, will. as a as a huge fan of Rogue. You will really enjoy this, especially it's it's written from uh, Stephanie Phillips, and she's a really phenomenal writer. Um, also picking up Spider Gwen Shadow Clones, I think issue number four or five, and then the last one I'm picking up is Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles number one forty, uh, which I'm excited about because there's a new artist um, on the series, Gavin Smith, who is from my home state of Indiana, and his cover looks amazing. So awesome! I'm very excited about that. So those are all my comics on my poll list. Thank you, everybody who submitted what they're reading. And thank you, everybody, for listening. Kevin, before we wrap up this episode, where can people find you online if, if you want them to find you online? If you're just like, no, I'm off uh, the grid, I'm off the grid. <laughs> no, I'm still I'm still online. Uh, at Hero City Kevin on Twitter is usually the best place to find me, although I'm not nearly as active there as I once was. So, well, thanks for joining the show and talking about mm -hmm. Superman. If you didn't get a chance to celebrate Superman Day yesterday, you know, there's nothing that says that you can only celebrate on Superman. Go out and, you know, you know, wear, you know, some sort of Superman memorabilia or something like that and celebrate this huge character that Kevin and I both love, that so many people love. Mm -hmm. And, you know, hope that you guys enjoy our uh, review of Superman Birthright. And that wraps up another episode of The Caps and Life. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button. You can follow us on social media at Caps and Life. For more information about us and all of our previous episodes, visit thecapsandlife.com. Mm -hmm.